So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, CSF Symposium uh, entitled Jack Inhibition, Are the Promises Fulfilled? So um, I would like to welcome the uh, virtual audience as well. So uh, next slide, please. So my name is Lai Shan Tam. I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I'm really uh, pleased to have three distinguished speakers today. So um, we will focus on the um, Jack inhibition on various uh, diseases today. So do we have, okay, so the objectives for today is to review the latest data on Jack inhibitors in the treatment of RA and to discuss the latest therapeutic effects in psoriatic arthritis management. And last but not least, to examine the latest data and guidelines in the treatment of axial spondyloarthritis. So next slide, please. So um, today um, we will have... Um, Professor um, Ernest Choi from UK talk about Jack inhibition in RA, followed by uh, Dr. Peter Nash from Australia uh, talking about um, therapeutic landscape of Gerson, followed by Dr. Uh, Kamila to talk about the latest review of the management of access to awareness. So, what is the to end your questions in using the uh, QA function? And we will have a QA session in the end. So, um, so let me introduce our speakers. So Professor Ernest Choi is the head of rheumatology and translational research. Uh, from, he's a clinical professor from the School of Medicine, Cardiff University, uh, UK. And Professor Peter Nash is a professor from the School of Medicine, Griffith University, Australia. Uh, professor Hidato Kamida is a professor of internal medicine from Toho University, Japan. So without further ado, uh, is it the first slide? So I think uh, we will, okay. So we would like to uh, invite Professor Ernest Choi to talk about Jack inhibition in RA. Professor Choi, please. Thank you, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Laisan, it's really great to be in Hong Kong again. Uh, and also welcome all of you in this virtual space. So these are my disclosures. <clears throat> uh, so as you all know, there are currently five JAK inhibitors approved for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis uh, globally. Uh, some uh, of them are available in different parts of the world. Uh, these are tofacitinib, baracitinib, upadicinib, fulgotinib, and perfidicinib. Uh, now, currently, there are some differences in how the regulators in the U.S. and in Europe in the labeling and recommendation of use of these JAK inhibitors uh, in rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, uh, for those who are from Europe, you will know that, in fact, the European Medicine Agency has very, very recently updated the label to align all the JAK inhibitors. It stated that JAK inhibitors should only be used in patients over 65 years of age, uh, in patients who are current or past smokers uh, and with other cardiovascular disease and patients with other malignancy risk factors if no suitable treatment available alternatives are available. And prescribers should discuss with the patients the risks associated with the use of JAK inhibitors including uh, myocardial infarction, lung cancer, and lymphoma. Uh, for the Drug and Food Administration in the U.S., they recommended that consider the benefit and risk with the JAK inhibitors. This is particularly the case for current or past smokers, other cardiovascular risk factors, those who develop a malignancy, and those with a lung malignancy other than a successfully treated non-mennonotic skin cancer. 
and reserve these medications for patients who have had an inadequate response or intolerant to one or more TNF inhibitors and counsel patients about the benefit and risk and advise them to seek emergency medical attention if they experience signs and symptoms of a heart attack, stroke, or blood clot. So there are some similarity, but also some differences in the recommendations. Now for, uh, the, for EULA, the recommendation for genus kinase inhibitors were updated also this year. And in fact, in the past, the role of JAK inhibitors is very similar to a biologic disease modifying drugs. It's recommended for patients who have failed to respond to methotrexate and a short course of oral steroids if the response is inadequate and they have poor prognostic factor, uh, then they should consider adding one of these advanced therapy. The modification is this year is that this still stay but added uh, additional risk assessment uh, for consideration for starting JAK inhibitors. And the statement states that the following risk factor for cardiovascular event and malignancy must be considered when intending to prescribe a JAK inhibitor. Age over 65, history or current uh, past smoking, other cardiovascular risk factor, other risk factors for malignancy and risk factors for thromboembolic events. So to align themselves with what the European uh, unions change in their label. So that is what the label and recommendation said. But what I'm going to show you in the next few slides is the real world data from Europe on the use of genus kinase inhibitors. This is the jackpot registry. It combined uh, data from 19 registries mostly in Europe, and they actually look at the use of biologic agents as well as genus kinase inhibitors uh, in these countries. And the first thing to say is that, is that the effectiveness uh, of genus kinase inhibitor seems to be very good. So this is the uh, 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 continuation rate or discontinuation rate of this advanced therapy having adjusted for multiple factors, which include age and the disease duration, seropositivity, a number of previous treatment. And you can see that in um, orange are the JAK inhibitors, in pink are the IL-6 inhibitors, and in blue, the TNF inhibitors. And what this uh, discontinuation curve shows is that, in fact, the continuation rate with treatment is actually higher with JAK inhibitors than with TNF inhibitors. And in fact, if we look at this using a forest plot, looking at the hazard ratio for discontinuation, you can see that the reason for uh, continuation due to continued efficacy is clearly superior for JAK inhibitors when compared with TNF inhibitor. The same is true for IL-6 inhibitors. For uh, abatacept, it's actually the same as TNF uh, inhibitors. What is uh, interesting from uh, the jackpot study is that when you look into detail of the characteristics of patients who have been given uh, these JAK inhibitors in different countries, if we look at the number of previous DMART used, you can see this number differ tremendously from country uh, to country. So you can see, for example, in Romania, 70 1.8% of patients started on the JAK inhibitors are biologic naive patients. And this contrasts with about 55% of patients, say, in uh, Spain, who were started on the genus kinase inhibitors, and almost all of these patients are biologic uh, experienced patients. In fact, many of them have felt at least three different biologic agents before. The other thing that is different is the fact that the proportion of patients who were given genus kinase inhibitor as combination therapy versus monotherapy are also very different uh, in different countries. And to show this graphically, to make it easier, I have put 
the percentage of patients who were biologic naive in blue, and those were given Janus kinase inhibitor uh, as monotherapy in gray. Now, you can see this number changes tremendously from country uh, to country. And oops, he is Romania showing large proportion of patients who are biologic naive, but most patients who started on a Janus kinase inhibitor were given it as combination therapy because the percentage of patients who receive it as monotherapy is only about 17%. Contrast this with Norway, only about uh, less than 20% of patients given a Janus kinase inhibitors were biologic naive, and most of these patients, over 50%, were given Janus kinase as a monotherapy. So this look at the variation in everyday practice on the use of uh, these inhibitors. Now, one thing that has recently uh, been answered by uh, the jackpot registry is about switching uh, or, or cycling among the Janus kinase inhibitor. Uh, as you know, one of the questions with the biologic is that should we cycle through one class of biologic agent or should we switch class? And increasingly, recommendations are saying that for biologic agents, we should be switching class rather than cycling through the Janus kinase inhibitors. Now, this slide look at patients who are switched from a Janus kinase inhibitor uh, to, another, uh, to another biologic agent versus a cycling to different Janus kinase inhibitor. And they separate the patients who had to stop the previous Janus kinase inhibitor due to ineffectiveness in blue or due to adverse event in orange. And now, in fact, regardless uh, of whether the patients uh, were switched uh, or, or, or cycled due to ineffectiveness or adverse event, the change in C dye score before and after treatment were pretty much the same between switching to a different biologic agent uh, versus cycling among, to a different Janus kinase inhibitor, suggesting that, in fact, cycling uh, could be effective. And I guess that does make sense in some way because the Janus kinase inhibitors are all small molecules. And so they follow uh, the principle of key differences in their pharmacokinetic profile. They are all metabolized and eliminated very differently. And of course, these factors are under strong genetic control. And that would explain why cycling uh, would be effective. Now, one of the uh, hottest topics recently has been the publication of the oral surveillance study, which looked at uh, the safety of uh, tofacitinib at two doses, 5 milligrams BID and 10 milligrams BID versus TNF inhibitor. So this study has been hotly debated, so I'm sure you are aware of um, the result. But at the most recent ACR, there was a very interesting analysis. And this analysis is based on the incidence of maze uh, event in patients, depending on whether they have a previous uh, major myocardial event before. And what it show here is that in the total facilitative group versus the TNF group, there was a difference in maze event in the patient who actually has a previous event before. If you look at the patient who did not have a previous event, then you can see that the event rate is very uh, uh, similar. And it follows a very important epidemiological principle of adverse event. In epidemiology, a previous event always predict another event. So it's true if you have a serious infection with one biologic, when you switch to a different uh, treatment, actually you still have the patient at a slightly higher risk. The major risk resides with the patient rather than the treatment. And in fact, we used that principle in a recent publication looking at the outcome of patients with COVID-19 who had inflammatory arthritis. And previous serious infection that led to hospital admission increased the risk of that patient having an adverse outcome, such as dying, by about 20%. Okay. Now, interestingly, the, uh, the oral surveillance data are not so easily replicatable 
or observe in registry data. And many of the registry uh, data show really conflicting results for some of these adverse events. So for example, in the switch, uh, Swedish Rheumatology Quality Registry, this is a big registry in Sweden with almost 20,000 patients treated with a TNF inhibitor and also over 2,000 patients treated with a Janus kinase inhibitor. And in this study, when they try to look at some of the adverse events such as cerebral vascular disease, other cardiac disease, and previous uh, VTE, what they found was that perhaps tofacitinib and baracitinib was associated with a higher risk of uh, VTEs uh, in these patients, and this is in comparison with the TNF inhibitor treated group. The rate of increase is pretty similar between baracitinib and tofacitinib. So this is one study suggesting that is the case. Having said that, if you start to look at this in comparison with uh, the event, what you notice is that the major increase in risk seems to be re residing in pulmonary emboli rather than uh, DVT. A different registry uh, this time, uh, and this registry is a registry uh, in Germany, and this time they did not find any significant difference uh, between maize and VTE in patients treated with uh, Janus kinase inhibitor compared with uh, TNF inhibitor. You can see that on the right-hand side of this slide, the statistics were not statistically significant. Now, even more recently, uh, at the Japanese uh, Rheumatology Congress, they uh, published the data mainly based on a baracitinib uh, post-marketing surveillance data. Then they look at the major adverse cardiovascular event and venous thrombosis event. You can see that there were seven patients uh, each with major adverse cardiovascular event and venous thrombosis event, seven patients each out of a total of 4,731 patients. And they really did not find any major increase uh, in risk. So I think there's still a lot of work to try to find out exactly the reason and the risk uh, associated with this adverse event in patients with rheumatoid arthritis at least, but we know that the Janus kinase has been used extensively in the treatment of inflammatory arthritis, and that include rheumatoid arthritis. And the real-world data show that the Janus kinase inhibitor have very similar uh, effectiveness to biologic DMARDs with very high rate of continuation. And cycling among Janus kinase inhibitors seems to have similar response to switching to biologic DMART, and the effectiveness of Janus kinase inhibitor has been confirmed by multinational registries. Last but not least is the JAK inhibitors are an important treatment option and has been used extensively, though caution is needed at the at-risk population. And with that, I'm happy to take any question you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I think, Ernest, maybe we can leave all the questions at the end. So um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Peter Nash. So uh, he's going to talk about uh, management of um, psoriatic arthritis. So thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you to CSF Forum uh, and to the sponsor of the symposium, uh, it's my pleasure to talk a little bit about PSA. I'm going to talk to you about the latest developments, not the usual stuff that you see, the things that are, uh, are common and uncommon and, and the latest things from ACR Convergence. Uh, and, whoops, that's, oh yeah, here we go. And don't blame the company or it's entirely my own opinion, my own topics blame me. We've done work with every major advanced therapeutic for the last 30 years or so in clinical trials. I show you the GRAPA guidelines. We've got a lot to get through in 15 minutes. They elevated these two domains to the domain approach that GRAPA has had in managing patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis. And they leave the decision individualized to yourself. And they simply show you which medications have efficacy in each domain for you to individualize your choice. But it's interesting they elevated these two as a new domains to consider. When you join CSF uh, Cytokine Signaling Forum, you get free downloads of presentations, 
publications, and I think a podcast or two, and I think you'd find it very educational. The question now with PSA is not how to treat, but which of these plethora of therapies we should use for which patient. And we can now select medication depending on which domain the patient has sitting in front of you to choose the most appropriate therapy. If you have axial involvement, you might pick this group of medications. If you have skin involvement, you might pick this group of medications and so on and so forth. And I've also added a new domain called safety because what we're noticing with the new therapies, the 17s, the 23s, and that their safety profile is quite outstanding, uh, particularly. So what are you gonna see? What are the hot topics in PSA? One of the hottest topics is how to pick the PSO patient who is most at risk of developing PSA. And you'll see a number of these tools coming out over the next few years. This is one from the um, Toronto group called the Presto, and they've done some nice work following patients for five years or so, regression coefficients, to see which of those things that will make you consider that this patient is at most risk. And then we have to prove that if we intervene early, we can actually change the long-term phenotype of the patient. This is a tiny study of only 10 patients, but very interesting, they used an imaging technique to see who would progress from psoriasis to psoriatic arthritis. And they were able to show that if you had this fancy gallium uptake in your fibroblasts, then you had a high chance of progressing if you did not, and we're only talking three patients, of course, then you had a very low chance of progressing. So, in fact, the other way around, they're the progressors and they're the non-progressors. So this is just a way of saying, let's do, this is hypothesis generating, let's do this in more patients over a longer period of time. No one's saying go out and do PET scans on your PSO patients, but I think you'll see a plethora of new studies in the next decade or so trying to decide which PSO patient is at highest risk to progress. Please do not forget the comorbidities that drive morbidity and mortality in PSA. And these are very simple interventions that all physicians can do and do not need expensive investigations. Smoking weight, alcohol, blood pressure, fatty liver, lipids, drugs, depression. This is physicianly stuff that we should not forget uh, when we treat our patients. What's new? A nice study that showed if you combine methotrexate and leflunamide, you do better reaching minimal disease activity, PASTAS low disease activity, DAPSA low disease activity, over a, small sh a short period of time in a small number of patients than if you use methotrexate alone. In our country, you must use two conventional synthetic DMARDs for 24 weeks before we are eligible for reimbursed advanced therapies. Premolast is the kind of drug that I would like to use as my second conventional agent with methotrexate prior to an advanced therapy, uh, but it's not available in our country because of its expense and modest efficacy, but good efficacy over time, and it helps patients lose weight if they can take it. TNFs remain the gold standard. They remain the uh, standard for which all new therapies have to be measured against. Nice study looking at what happens if you withdraw patients from their TNF. This is in non-radiographic AXPAR, just to show you that if you increase the disease duration, sorry, if you increase the duration um, between injections, you do not lose a lot of patients. But if you stop suddenly, these patients will flare. Do not stop your medication suddenly, your patients will flare. The good news is that you can recapture them. So taper rather than stop. S these kinds of studies have not really been done very well in PSA. Georg Schett's group did and they found that stopping, they nearly all flared. So clearly the gold standard against which everything else has to be measured, but the biosimilars are out there and many countries are being forced to use biosimilars like Denmark. The only benefit is cost and the biggest furphy of all is that you can treat more patients. I cannot treat more patients if the access rules remain difficult. So hopefully as things get cheaper, the access rules might 
event might change and improve and I can treat uh, more patients with less expensive medications. We need head-to-head -head studies. We need strategy studies in our field. The derms do them routinely. The rheumatologists have been slow to take it up. Here's the only two proper head-to-head -head studies really in our field uh, of the IL-17 inhibitors. This is the latest IL-17 inhibitor, which is the 17A and the 17F bimikizumab. They presented lots of nice data at um, ACR Convergence in Philadelphia, mainly the, the long-term 52-week data, which showed no loss of effect over time. Um, I won't do that one. There's a new 17 on the block that they're investigating. This is a small phase two study of an agent that had binding domains to 17, bound very strongly to albumin and blocked A but not F. The idea being the uptake into the synovium and into tissue will be very strong, but the results really are fairly modest, not a lot better than the prior agents. So really we have five 17 inhibitors either marketed or under development how many more do we need unless there's a giant advantage? We'll have to wait and see, but they are going into phase three. If I lived in the Asia Pacific, to have agents like the 17 inhibitors and the 23 inhibitors, which really don't show much of a TB signal, that would be very interesting for me to treat my PSA patients. In the entire clinical trial program, apart from one quantiferon changing, none of the 17 patients reactivated TB, and you could argue very similar for the IL-23 inhibitors, and to me that's pretty important. <clears throat> Lots of, 17, of 23 inhibitors, the P19 inhibitors on the block, there's going to be four of them, and how we pick between them is a very difficult question to answer. Whether you use minimal disease activity or the, this should be reserved for clinical trials. Uh, nice data presented at ACR out to a year without loss of effect over time. This is uh, you looking at another 23 inhibitor that is given subcutaneously every 12 weeks and is coming to the Asia Pacific. And this is an example of the CSF slide you can download for free. I encourage you to join CSF forum. Uh, and it's really talking about a three, the 76 week data uh, and showing quite nice efficacy, as you would expect. And this is the other one that's going to come called Tildrakizumab, which will be coming to a street corner near you. So you'll have four 23s to pick from. God knows how we're supposed to decide that. Now we have some lovely um, jack inhibitors, as we've heard, work effectively in PSA. And rather than show you the select data of efficacy and safety for PSA 1 and PSA 2, I thought I'd mention that the gender effect on PSA patients is now really one of those key areas being studied by GRAPA because females have higher disease activity at baseline and they have a lesser response to therapy over time. And I think in future trials going forward, we should stratify at baseline for gender, just like we do for those patients on and off methotrexate. The other <clears throat> interesting jack is the TIC2 um, inhibitor, really jack 4 if you like. It doesn't bind in the ATP binding site like the normal jack inhibitors that you're used to. It binds covalently in the pseudokinase regulatory domain, has a half-life of about 10 hours and looks to be quite nice uh, in PSA. It's licensed already in the US for psoriasis. Psoriatic arthritis is around the corner. Looks interesting. <clears throat> One message is that these patients have an incidence of skin rash and acne that I've never seen in my rheumatoid patients, but the derms tell me upadacitinib and atopic dermatitis cause the same thing. So interesting that in different patient populations, there's different manifestations of things to be aware of. Acne and rash in this patient population with this drug and presented at ULAR and again something that we'll see moving forward is that there are a number of biomarkers that might suggest which patient is going to do best with which drug. Which would be the best patient to give this 
TIC2 inhibitor 2. So they are the kinds of research fields that we're going to find coming forward over the next year or two. Again, not a huge study, phase two, but interesting that they could use pathway biomarkers to predict who's going to respond both with skin and joint to a TIC2 inhibitor. <coughs> Next, not just TIC2 inhibition, now combinations between TIC2 and JAK1 also showed very nice efficacy in a nice phase two study presented at ULA. So interesting, we're going to see nasal, inhaled, intranasal, inhaled for asthma, we're going to see topical JAKs and now we're seeing combination JAKs. As, jo as um, Ernest has beautifully shown, doesn't matter how effective it is if it's not safe. All these drugs carry baggage um, and we have to individualise our choice depending on that baggage. We've been managing this baggage for 20 years and used them very successfully. But you could make a list of what issues the clinician worries about for each drug. And you could go down that list and you could decide it's not so much which drug for which person, but which drug not for this person because of their individual comorbidities, concomitant medications, etc., and also the practical issues of cost and administration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, pregnancy, lactation. So that's a kind of practical list that will decide which drug for which patient in your hands. Where is the future to finish? The future <coughs> may well be combination therapies because the newer agents are so safe in relative terms, the 17s, the 23s, they're now studying them in combination with the TNF. And whether in the past you tried to combine biologics, we did IL-1 TNF, Abatacept TNF, Retux TNF, infection was a major, major problem. They've now shown Bimikizumab 17 plus Sertilizumab TNF, no safety penalty, but they studied rheumatoid, not PSA. Um, Janssen are now studying Gisulcomag plus Golimumab in PSA. We look forward to seeing how that works out. The microbiome is being shown to be of increasing importance in the entire AXPA world, including PSA, and I think we'll see some advances in therapy based on the microbiome. And finally, Yoshi Tanaka has a lovely um, early proof of principle study of a small number of patients where they use flow cytometry to define different phenotypes. A 17 phenotype, a TNF phenotype, a 1223 phenotype, and a combined phenotype. And if you give the patient with the right phenotype the right drug, it was easy to show significant benefit in signs and symptoms as well as skin if you tried to be more on the side of precision medicine. Small study, 60 odd patients, it's now being rolled out around the world and wouldn't it be nice to have a patient come in and sit down who needs an advanced therapy, you do flow cytometry and it gives you some idea like the breast cancer doctors, HER2, oestrogen receptor, etc. which agent for which particular patient. So I thank you very much for your interest. We've raced through an enormous amount of ground over a very short period of time, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. And my talk is latest overview of the management of Axper. And this is my disclosure statement. And as you all know, pathophysiology of Axper it's divided into two phases. First, inflammatory phases. First, developed the micro injury and response of immune cells, including R17 and TNF production. And as a post inflammatory phase, excessive inflammation leads to newborn formation as a result of over repairing. And actual spa is included in CSF, Cytokine Signaling Forum, in this year. And during the first six months, 26 papers have been selected and featured. And among these, I selected 11 papers and divided it into two topics. First, structural changes and the bow or targeted synthetic dimers. And the second topic is prediction of treatment response and subsequent biodemers were drug-free remission. 
Uh, this is the first paper in spinal radiographic progression and predictors of progression in patients with radiographic axper receiving exekizumab over two years. And as you can see, the majority of patients with axper receiving exekizumab had no radiographic progression in the spine through two years of treatment. And when we compare the natural historical control or when we compare Q4 week and Q2 week, exekizumab seems to be beneficial for prevent of radiographic progression. And this is a very interesting study. This is observational proof of concept study aimed to analyze the effect of TNF inhibitors on osteoblast osteoblastic activity using sodium fluoride, PET, and MRI. So sodium fluoride is uh, very specific for osteoblast, they say. And key results were shown here. And the anti-TNF treatment led to significant decrease of osteoblastic activity within three to six months. And especially it was shown in PET plus bone marrow edema or PET plus fat lesions. And early initiation of anti-inflammatory therapy with TNF inhibitor may achieve a beneficial anti-osoblastic effect and subsequent radiographic progression. And this is the impact of filgotinib or sacroiliac joint magnetic resonance imaging structural regions at 12 weeks in patients with active ankylosing spondylitis from Tortuga trial. So this is a JAK inhibitor trials, and using the SI joint MRI. And when we see these results, especially erosion and backfill are significantly different between ferrogotinib 200 milligram versus placebo. And JAK inhibitor ferrogotinib was associated with MRI structure benefits in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. It's a very small study. And how about the spine? This sub-analysis of Tortuga trial demonstrated both vertebral body and post posterior lateral spine inflammation in AS patient. And as you can see, total spine inflammation significantly decreases with ferrogotinib treatment as compared with placebo. So ferrogotinib treatment was associated with significant reductions in MRI measures of spinal inflammation, including vertebral bodies, facet joints, and posterior lateral elements. And how about the uparacetam, a very potent JAK inhibitors? This is a select trials, and uparacetinib shows very nice response in terms of ASAS-40 response through week 14 as compared with placebo, even in bio-naive and bio-IL patients. And then how about the patients with non-radiographic axial spondylarthritis? Again, Uparacetinib shows very nice response in terms of ASAS-20 or ASAS-40 or ASAS partial remission or BASTI-50 response. So uparacetinib was associated with a significant increase in patient response with ASAS-20, 40, partial remission, BASTI-50 over placebo. Then I'm going to move on to the prediction of response. First, TNA inhibitor, Celerizopegol. And when we see the Celerizopegol efficacy in patients with NRAXPER stratified by baseline MRI and CRP status, then we can see that Celerizopegol treatment shows beneficial effect across all MRI CRP subgroups, but some numerically higher response in CRP 
and MRI double positive patients as compared with single positive patients, especially in ASTA's major improvement. Then, how about the Ixekismab R17 inhibitors? Again, Ixekismab demonstrated efficacy in the treatment of radiographic asthma in patients with and without elevated CRP or evidence of spinal inflammation on MRI. But when we see some difference between CRP low or CRP high patient groups, especially for Ixekismab Q4 weeks, And this is a very big topic, as Peter says, the male versus female patient. And as you can see, even in radiographic or non-radiographic expert patient, male patients shows rapid response to the treatment, and female patient shows some delayed response to exekismum in these course V, W, and X trials. Then, how about the Baudima's discontinuation? This shows that continuing exekismal treatment significantly delayed time to flare versus withdrawal to placebo across groups. But one very good news is the majority of patients withdrawn from exekismal to placebo recaptured at least low disease activity and over half of those patients met the criteria for inactive disease with exekismab retreatment. So we can try, but uh, the chance of disease flare after discontinuation of exekismab is very high. Then, how about the drug-free remission is the final goal, but only 18% of patients with early onset ASPA were in drug-free remission at the five-year visit in the Zia cohort. And there is a low probability of being in drug-free remission for patients with recent onset ASPA. And this is linked to the lower baseline disease activity and function scores while TNF inhibitor is associated with poor chances later being in drug-free remission. So only milder patients may be unsuccessful in drug-free remission. Then finally, I'm going to introduce the updated ASAS Euler recommendations for the management of AXPA 2022 update, very recently published. And when we see overarching principles essentially similar as compared with the previous version and initial four recommendations as well. But big change was observed in recommendation 9, 10, 11, and 12, and major change in recommendation 9 and 12 was the reason Professor uh, Ernest Choi has explained about the concern, safety concerns for JAK inhibitors. And two recommendations were added. Number 10, if there is a history of recurrent uveitis or active inflammatory bowel disease, preference should be given to a monoclonal antibody against TNF. And in patients with significant thrombosis, an R17 inhibitor may be preferred. And recommendation 11, absence of response to treatment should prompt re-evaluation of the diagnosis and consideration of the presence of comorbidities. And when we see an algorithm, clinical diagnosis of expert is very important. And for all patients, we need education, regular exercise, and quit smoking, as well as physiotherapy. And if the patient is symptomatic, start NSAID. And if NSAID failed, then we may consider, especially for purely active disease patients, start targeted therapy, especially T 
TNF inhibitor or R17 inhibitor in the current practice. And when failed, then we may switch to another biodemus or JAK inhibitors to aiming the control. And this may be the final slide. First, before we use treatment with biological demers or JAK inhibitors, we need rheumatologist diagnosis of actual spa, and we need some confirmation of objective active lesion suggested by elevated CRP or positive MRI SI joint or radiographic sacroiliitis and failure of standard treatment and high disease activity as defined with ASTAS 2.1 or greater, and finally, positive rheumatologist opinion. In conclusion, the pathophysiology of AXPER has been recently elucidated. The clinical and imaging efficacy of TNF, R17, and JAK inhibitors have been established. Azura recommendations for the management of AXPER have been updated in this year. Thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Professor Kamida, for your comprehensive update. So may I ask all the uh, speakers to come up to the stage and we can have some Q&A session. Yes, Munho. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. I would like to have a very practical question on cycling the JAK inhibitor for inefficacy. So how long would you, in, in case we are really cycling among the three available JAK inhibitor, how long would you wait to cycle another one? The first question, and the other, the second one is, do you have a preferred sequence of how to cycle them? Would it be some bearing with the previous DEMA history or bio DEMA history that you will have different strategy to cycle these available JAK inhibitor? Thank you. So that is a fantastic question. I don't have the perfect answer because we don't have evidence base. I can only answer that based on uh, experimental understanding of where we are. So if it's <coughs> due to inefficacy, uh, one of the first, first thing I would look at is, are there any potential reason for the inefficacy that may be explained by patient characteristic? Uh, liver function, renal function, which may affect the elimination. Uh, of the drug drug interaction, and I always check, and this is really important for orally taking medication. Is are the patient really taking the medication as you prescribe them? Because sometimes patients don't take the medication as you prescribe them. And then, once after that has been considered, then I would tend to, if I choose initially a very JAK selective inhibitor, then I may actually want to go for a JAK inhibitor that inhibit other JAK isoform other than JAK1. And that is based on a little bit broader inhibition of GMCSF. So are there any other questions? I actually don't see any questions um, submitted via the apps. So perhaps, you know, Peter, uh, you have highlighted a very uh, hot topic, is the agenda effect. Do you have uh, you know, any hypothesis why do we have a poor response in the female gender? Lee Haida has um, published a little bit on this, and it's a major grappa project going forward. I think it's called the SAGE project. There's some differences in background hormones, which will have an effect on, uh, on, on PSA. Um, there's differences in axial, it's a little bit more easy to understand when you have a, a, an area of false positive MRIs in women who've had a number of children and athletes and it's why in the new AXPAR guidelines they said to reconsider the diagnosis if there's no response because there's this issue of overreading MRIs and then once you get on a biologic for AXPAR you cycle endlessly through them without really responding. Uh, I'm not sure it's very clear why uh, they should have a higher baseline disease activity. Maybe they uh, come to therapy late. 
they um, complain less, and then when things are measured, they're more active. And why the response should be different, that's also not as clear. So I can't really answer your question, but the SAGE project hopefully will answer it for you. Thank you. So I also have a question for uh, Professor Kamida. So um, um, in, in you, you mentioned uh, now, you know, there's a label, you know, suggesting that we should consider the um, safety of the JAK inhibitor also, although the data is originally from rheumatoid arthritis, and we should also consider that concern in our ex-spa patient. So, so what is your comment about this, uh, you know, restriction? Thank you for your question. As you know, uh, the patient's age, mean age, is totally different from rheumatoid arthritis and ASPA. And also, some obesity difference between PSA versus ASPA. So, simply uh, thinking, the ASPA patient may be the right person to be treated with JAK inhibitor as compared with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis is obese. But uh, we do not know clear evidence or clear data. So my suggestion is the risk may be lower as compared with other two diseases. But still, we have to consider the little bit elevated risk, even in ASPA patient. And also, um, I want to discuss about the gender difference. And also, we all know that methylate response is totally different between male and female in rheumatoid arthritis. But actually, we do not know the exact reason why. Do you know any comments from all three guys? OK, well, I think <laughs> Gender and sex are very different words these days, first, first of all, and that, that, that is a tricky thing for us to tackle in the UK. I have to go on a lesson to learn about that. Uh, I, think, I think it is challenging at several respects. One is hormone rarely explain the full picture. I think enough research has been done to tell us that hormone will answer that. And obviously there are genetic differences but also, one level uh, in assessing response is that we know the response to pain is very different. So, for example, if you just take a healthy individual and you test them for their response to pain, the initial response is always higher in female than in male. But the male actually are more likely to forget the experience than the female. So the chronicity and reference are very different. And that's, that has been shown 30 years ago. And if you look at pain response in trials, you tend to get a slightly higher pain response in female. And that just is what we know about the biology of nociception. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so I think um, we have, uh, you know, learned a lot um, about, uh, you know, JAK inhibition in managing all the inflammatory arthritis today. And uh, I would like to uh, thank our speakers for their excellent presentation. And I would also like to thank the audience in person or virtual for your participation. And with that, I would like to end this session and I would like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much.